Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Lewis Metzger and I'm the director of New Wine, New Wineskins. Welcome to New Wine Tastings, where every week we'll have an opportunity to engage people from diverse backgrounds, all in the attempt to build relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. We are desirous of the opportunity to engage in deep and meaningful ways, and we're really thrilled and excited to have you with us. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, and I'm here with my friend, Tony Wynn, who's a pastor in the area, and uh, welcome to New Wine Tastings. Uh, Tony, let's talk about theology and culture, as we always do with uh, New Wine Tastings. Absolutely. So, Paul, with, with the semester having just started for us here at Multnomah, um, could you tell us uh, about some of the topics you've been introducing to your students? Well, in a theology and culture class, I, I make use of throughout the semester of the movie Interstellar, which I just mm. find a fascinating movie. It gets at some really hardcore science with astrophysics and the like, quantum and the like, and uh, brings it into uh, space exploration uh, when planet Earth is near death and the need to expand our horizons, so to speak. And it talks about relationships and, and uh, just, it's a very holistic movie dealing with all kinds of factors. And I love the uh, op-ed or the piece that David Brooks, a uh, great journalist who writes the New York Times, uh, did several years ago on the movie Interstellar, where he talks about it as a cultural event. Hmm. And he contrasts um, the Newtonian age with the quantum age and says that unlike in the post-Newtonian world where basically reality was cogs in a machine, uh, natural environment and the world at large, cogs in a machine, interstellar being a cultural event really frames matters by way of particles and waves in a vast ecosystem. So I go through that, that cultural event incorporated into uh, theology and culture and ask the students throughout the semester to think through how do we move from a cog in a machine approach to life, a cog in a machine approach to ministry, a cog in a machine approach to work and relationships, to particle and wave in a vast ecosystem, and drawing from Athanasius and Maximus and others, and the biblical text, you see Paul in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 1 and 2, you know, Christ is the head and the body flows from him and then also Christ is the firstborn over all creation mm -hmm. really Christ is from a traditional orthodox christian perspective the ecosystem right. you know in as paul says in acts 17 in him we live and move and have our being about god and again acts 17 and so we're we're dealing with you know if christ or the triune god is this ecosystem uh, the one in whom we live and move and have our being he's beyond us outside of us he's within us closer to us, I believe C.S. Lewis said, than we are to ourselves, always distinct from us, but penetrating all of life and holding all things mm -hmm. together. What difference does that make if we see all of life relationally, mm -hmm. not cogs that are easily replaceable mm -hmm. from a machine, but really particles and waves in a vast ecosystem where mm -hmm. everything and everyone is somehow indispensable, the butterfly effect, making impact mm -hmm. across the universe. And that's really striking to have students write on that subject and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And uh, actually made use of that years ago for our science grant with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Got permission from them to make use of pop culture where there was good science behind it, as in the movie Interstellar, and drawing from that toward theology and culture. So yeah. I've enjoyed doing that and applying that to our own context mm -hmm. of life and ministry. And to me, one of the areas that I illustrated it from uh, in class this week was, you know, some friends recently lost a child, some de very dear friends, and uh, that child is irreplaceable. You can't look at a child, well, let's just have another child um, to make up for it, uh, for making up for the loss of this child. And another friend was grieving with a few of us over the loss of our friend's um, teenage, teenage uh, daughter from a long-standing disease and this other friend started weeping. He broke down and wept because he and his wife had lost their firstborn. Mm -hmm. This was a firstborn that was lost at 19. Their firstborn mm -hmm. out of the womb many years ago. And while they've had two other children who give them great joy and they dearly love, each child is irreplaceable. You can't say, well, we'll just have another to replace. People aren't cogs. It's not a machine. I'm all for machines. There's a place for machines and you have cogs in a machine, but we cannot reduce life to cogs in a machine. And Interstellar 
it's just very thought provoking how it gets at even themes like love that uh, it's it's a po more powerful force as powerful more powerful than gravity um, might be said so just it, it caused us to think and that was an illustration I used and how often do we and like you're a youth pastor how do we look at our youth are they disposable cogs replaceable cogs are my students replaceable cogs is a spouse is a parent um, are people, are, you know, creation as a whole, or are we like particles and waves, deeply connected, interconnected, uh, like with interstellar in this vast ecosystem that we see in light of the triune God, yeah. Father, Son, and Spirit? When when you shared um, in regards to to people within the New One community experiencing loss, I think ministerially when we look at um, at loss and how it relates to to the people that we serve, I think what Christ has for us uh, when the church fathers say the unassumed is the unhealed, when Christ is present with us in the presence of loss, he isn't trying to replace hmm. that which was lost. Um, because that which was lost is not a machine, nor are we uh, machines. And and the, the parts of our lives that make up our lives aren't replaceable pieces. And so when we look at the analogy um, that we draw from interstellar of um, vast a vast ecosystem and, and particles it's not that those particles are replaceable it's not particles in ways they're they're, they're really connected absolutely so loss there's a vacuum absolutely and it's and it, Christ doesn't come with you know a glue stick and just bind us back together or just plug something back in absolutely. it's a relational presence not to take away our grief right but to heal us relationally with That's his presence, good. even while this gaping hole is there. Right. Um, Lazarus, you know, come forth and Mary, Martha, you know, the, the weeping and That's Jesus good. weeping. And uh, powerful how he connects in a right. relational, deeply relational mm -hmm. way. And he, he doesn't try to fill that vacuum, I don't believe. I think he's present with us in that vacuum. And I think when we look at ministry and, and how the church walks alongside its parishioners or congregants and members who've experienced profound loss. At times, um, ministerially, it may be easier to be pragmatic, to, to look for a fix and say, man, that, that hole you have, that sense of loss or absence, Christ fills mm -hmm. that space or that void. But I think that's, that's pragmatic and then eventually that answer becomes trite and and it's hollow hollow I mean, absolutely people mean well right i mean people, absolutely. we're trying to comfort people it's not that but how often have we turned jesus into you know a quick fix right. or again a glue stick right and uh a hole filler right um whereas he came to share life right. with us absolutely. in the midst of our grief absolutely okay. and because when when a machine breaks we move to repair the machine um we move to replace the, the component of the machine that's broken down. But when we experience profound loss or grief, there isn't um, something to be repaired. It's, it's to, there's something that needs to be healed, not to replace that which is, is um, lost or broken, but to say that that, that void can be restored. Um, and I think not to move towards a semantical debate or, or to say that uh, we're, we're pushing this analogy to its furthest extensions, but just provide us with the language mm -hmm. to say um, relationships don't operate on terms of being replaceable, yeah. but relationships operate on, on an interconnectedness, and it's Christ that we have our interconnectedness, it's in Christ that we have our moving and our being, and it's in Christ that we find um, that he has assumed our, our humanity, and that he experiences loss with us mm -hmm. on our behalf, so that one day we no longer experience loss. Right. Yes, and so, you know, God with us, Emmanuel, you know, the hope of the Christmas season is not a hope just for Christmas. It's the whole year. It's our whole lives. And, you know, I think sometimes with that kind of fix the problem mentality, you know, how often have I been asked or someone in my family has shared something with me and I quickly go to fixing the problem. And sometimes I'll have 
you know, a family member say to me, I wasn't looking for you to fix mm. the problem. I wanted to share my struggle Absolutely. with you. I'm so quick to try and fix the problem. I'm a problem solver. And there's a place for that. But sometimes it's just to sit with mm. and listen to and share in the struggle. And that's hard for me to do. Mm. And, you know, I was talking to a pastor the other day who said, in his context, he's native Hawaiian, he was saying, you know, in our context, we will allow, uh, certain Native American, Native Hawaiian context will allow for grief, for people who are going through extreme grief, you know, a time of months, year, to allow that. But often, you know, we, we throw a biblical text, and well-meaning, well-meaning. How often have I done it? I've been well-meaning. Others, too. Mm. So it's not to fault people mm. for the desire to comfort, but often it's we're, we're driven to kind of repair Absolutely. At times it's to repair a machine, Absolutely. and and that just can't be done. And so, like, you know, uh, the biblical text from Romans that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and been called according to His purposes in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful text. But when someone's going through profound loss, mm -hmm. that text can leave them hollow. Absolutely. And I think we need to be not only speaking truth, but in the right context. Right. And that takes us even to the subject of theology, too, Absolutely. is that how do we speak truth in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. contextual way, and not treat theology as just some kind of machine. Absolutely. And you were talking about that with me Absolutely. a little earlier. Because I, I think when we look at our young people, oftentimes where theology or the church has failed young people is that we appropriately and accurately address the biblical context but then we misapply it to the context and the life of the young person and that's where theology may oftentimes break down because we view um, the person the young person as uh, irreparably broken and we try to fix them by using an appropriate biblical context where there's, there's a loss in translation. And I think of, in our conversation of um, Dr. James Cone, mm -hmm. the late Dr. James Cone, how recently there has been um, a critique, if not criticism, of Dr. Cone's theology. And I wonder if in critiques and criticisms of Dr. Cone, there's a failure to, to address his uh, social context, his communal context, and there's a view of his theology in a machination in the sense that, okay, Dr. Cohn may not believe in inerrancy or penal substitutionary atonement, and we take those theological systems and components as, as parts in a theological machine that, because this part of Dr. Cohn's theology isn't in alignment with other, say, evangelical sensibilities, We ha that component makes a whole machine, his whole theological system broken. But I wonder if we had approach, or those who critique Dr. Cohn approach it, his theology from a sense of its communal context within the mm -hmm. African-American experience, mm -hmm. that the biblical context addresses um, Dr. Cohn's communal context and how um, in his seminal text, uh, Christ in the Lynching Tree. Um, cross of the Lynching Tree? The cross, yeah. Yes, the Cross of the Lynching Tree addresses not only the biblical context, but also his communal context. Yeah, and so let's let's speak to that in a little bit. And I really valued what you were sharing. I thought it was really uh, very thoughtful and, and prophetic and really brings us into this discussion in a, in a beautiful way. Yes, I mean, there have been criticisms made just very recently. He died, what, was it last year or yeah. the... Uh, uh, the year before, I mean, recently, I'm, yeah, yeah, it was recently, and so he's not here to defend himself. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the strong charge, perhaps even of heresy, mm -hmm. was uh, thrust uh, toward his his work, and, and and those that's that's a big word that you know people throw that word around uh, at times very loosely. I'm not saying the people who uttered it mm -hmm. did, but often that's used like, oh, what a heretic, and, and people don't even realize that you know you could be burned at the stake for that yeah. historically in the ancient and uh, medieval church contexts and, and the like. So uh, that's a very big charge and I think to your point that we often see theology as just a machine and maybe these cogs and parts and the like. And while I hold to penal substitutionary atonement and I hold to inerrancy and, and the like, I think that we need to account for, as you said so beautifully, you know, context and communal context. And uh, I don't realize how often my theology is white. Um, uh, that I am shaped by my own communal context. And I have noth 
no problem with being white. Uh, I, I, I love being who I am, but I also need to cherish what other people are. And I need to situate myself in my theology, my own communal context, that, you know, where I grew up, you know, my educational context, my relationships, all those shape my theology. It doesn't relativize my theology per se, but it personalizes, Absolutely. contextualizes my theology. I think we need to do the same thing with James Cone. You hear a lot of talk about identity politics and all this identity politics, and I'm thinking, well, there's such a thing as white identity politics, too, that we have uh, hoisted upon us today. And I think sometimes even well-meaning people can make critiques seeking to be true to the Bible and seeking to be true to historic Orthodox Christianity, and I cherish that, so I, I support that, that drive and that tenacity. We also have to think big picture. And what is it that maybe given my own situation, in my own particular communal context, I'm not seeing everything. And James Cohn, the father of black theology, and we can easily say, oh, that's just black theology. Well, well, then maybe I should call mine white theology. Well, we call it systematic theology, and I'm a systematic theologian and a theologian of culture, but it's still always a situated theology. Everyone's theology is situated. None of us give the once for all, delivered to the saints kind of right. thrust. Jude or the, the Bible as a whole might give us that, well, it does give us that foundational, um, you know, orthodoxy, you know, as, as scripture. But even there, it's not exhaustive. Right. You know, there's still further thought to be done. It gives us the foundations and the rule of our faith, so to speak. But with Cone as the father of black theology, I don't want to limit him just to that. As he's dealing with black theology, it's often the marginalized. It's what he's talking about. Those who are on the underside, who aren't accounted for, and how God identifies in that book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which I use in a contemporary theologies class, is such a pivotal text for us coming to terms with theology in the American context, in our racialized society, where, you know, for the African-American church tradition, you know, it was Jesus. Talk about pain. Jesus didn't come to fill a hole, to put a cog back in a machine. He came to identify with the African-American church community, where so often for them, as, as Cohen argues, it's not somehow a substitute. Regardless of what he might think about penal substitution, it's Jesus' identification, a victor in the midst of victimization, that Jesus hangs on that lynching tree, which mm. was a horror, and can still be a horror to the African-American church context. You know, the KKK and others... You know, they get their vigilante justice, they, you know, try an African-American and they lynch them on a lynching tree. And right. so the cross and the lynching tree, not some distant cross, and I'm not demeaning anything about the cross in history, but it's not just Jesus dying on the cross as our substitute, as biblical as that is, he is our substitute, but he's also our representative. He is our participant. Right. He, he provides victory. So it's not just penal substitution, it's Christus Victor. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of other models of the atonement have to be accounted for because the atonement, God's reconciling us, atoning for our sins, um, bringing salvation, it's a, the atonement is a multifaceted doctrinal jewel. And when we only account for one facet because of our own particular communal context and make that everything, um, we're in danger of doing real disservice to the community as a whole. So I think we need to be very careful about that language and really think through what was Cone doing in his communal context, which I'm missing out on doing because I don't see Absolutely. everything theologically. And we need to account for the whole body of Christ and learn what am I missing? Not just what they're missing. What am I missing? And what can I learn from them in terms of the cross and the lynching tree. Absolutely. With Dr. Cohn, I, I think there is a echo of uh, the patristic statement of the unassumed is the unhealed, where we see in Cohn's theology, uh, Christ isn't just some amorphous person, but he, right. he identifies with the particular yeah. suffering yeah. of the black community. When we think of uh, the biblical motifs even of communion <coughs> and how with the lynching tree, the, the prophetic pointing of what is that strange fruit mm. that hangs from mm. the tree. And we look at Christ and how Christ says, uh, take of my body. Mm. I think there is this biblical motif that points to that strange fruit mm. on the lynching tree. Mm. And how Christ identifies himself mm. with our African brothers and sisters who were unjustly lynched. 
Um, I think there's something to be said about the particularity of the suffering that Christ identifies with. Mm. It's not this amorphous experience. It's not this generalized human experience that Christ addresses. But Christ assumes a particular human experience. In each situation, through Absolutely. the Spirit. In our context, your context, Absolutely. mine, others. Because Christ, the eternal Word, becomes flesh. And it's, as you said, not amorphous, not without form. It's not formless. It's always particular. And I think of Uchimura Kanzo, the great Japanese uh, figure, um, son of a samurai, uh, late 19th, early 20th century figure, who, in his critique of Western Christianity and missionary efforts, mm -hmm. I think there are many good missionary efforts, but he was quite critical because he felt that what was being presented to Japan was an amorphous mm -hmm. Christianity, a formless Christianity, whereas he said, no, what we're given often is a Western Christianity. And he says John Knox, the Apostle Paul, were not amorphous in how they engaged. It was always particularized. And we need to account for particular contexts. Leslie Newbegin said, there's no such thing as you know, a, a non-cultural mm. or an unenculturated gospel. Mm. It's always enculturated. Jesus became Jewish man. Mm -hmm. He became a particular in time. And though he is the eternal word, he becomes a particular of history, logos and sarcos, in fleshed word, in a particular context. Born of a woman, as Paul says, born in the fullness of time, under the law, born of a woman. And we need to account for that. And the spirit of Pentecost contextualizes that to each of our situations as we account for Jesus in his own historic Jewish particularity and build those bridges through wisdom in the spirit in the church community globally and here throughout history to our contextual situations wherever we may be found. Mm -hmm. And that lends back to our opening analogy with Interstellar. It's that vast ecosystem, the interconnectedness of the particles and molecules. It's not this cold, um, efficient machine with replaceable cogs and parts. Um, but because of Christ's particularity, there's an interconnectedness that we all share in and through Christ, and that our suffering or sense of profound loss or grief isn't um, generalized, mm. but that we can uh, mm. empathize with yeah. one another, and that our theology should serve the movement towards empathy because of Christ. Um, and I think that's that's profound, and we see that in Dr. Cohn's theology, that, that it's accessible to all of us, though we may not experience the same sense of loss or persecution or oppression that the black African community experience, we can share in, in unity because of Christ. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite striking. We talk about perspective and we talk about context and communal context and not speaking simply truth, but truth in context and in a meaningful manner, accounting for our own communal settings and, uh, you know, culture. Uh, we have to account for a contemporary culture, uh, and it's not just high culture, but pop culture, mm -hmm. and different situations in which we find ourselves. We started out with Interstellar, and we talked about particle and wave. We went on to talk about evil and machinations, and you know, fill in the you know the gap and hole with some cog, you know, of goodness, um, and really that's going to leave things hollow. It's got to be a relational thrust and a communal contextualization. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we move forward with perspective, like I'm thinking of another pop cultural rendition, not just Interstellar yeah. that we started out with, but also The Messiah. It's a Netflix series, and I was asked to view the series and, and write on it at my blog column at Pathos, Uncommon God, Common Good. And uh, you haven't had a chance to watch that series yet, have not you? Yet, yeah, not yet. Yeah, but it's, it's a fascinating series, and I've watched the first series, mm -hmm. season. That's all they have so far. But you're really not sure this, this figure, you know, where is he from? Uh, is he from Iran? Is he from, you know, Palestine? Where is he from? And talks about his origins, who his parents were at, at some point in season one. But CIA is involved, foreign governments involved, Israel has its own uh, intelligence forces involved, trying to figure out, is this a terrorist? Is it someone who is, uh, you know, just, a, you know, you know, a fake? Revolutionary. Uh, is it, yeah, is he a revolutionary? Is he the Messiah? Is he the second coming of Jesus? I won't spoil it for people, but it's really striking about the perspectives because there are all these perspectives 
based on things that he does and how people perceive him. Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking about perspective in, in many respects mm -hmm. here. And uh, it's striking to me because the, the genre that this series is based on is, um, it, it comes from, uh, Uch uh, not Uchimune Kanzo I mentioned earlier, but Kurosawa Akita, the famous Japanese film uh, director who's influenced Scorsese and numerous others. Uh, he did The Seven Samurai, he, he may be most famous for that. He did Dreams. He also did Rashomon, uh, and, which is a, a classic movie, a deeply disturbing film, starring uh, Mifune, the great samurai actor. But in this film, he is a, uh, is he a thief? Is he he's someone in the woods who uh, spies this samurai and uh, his wife or his fiance, and uh, there is what is taken to be a rape uh, and a murder, but it's given from different angles, like his angle, the, the, the thief's angle in the forest, and from other people's angles, and you're, you're, you're wondering, okay, what's, what's, what really happened? Are we only left with perspectives? What about justice? What about truth? Um, and not to relativize matters, uh, there's certainly truth and justice to pursue, but in the movie or the series on Messiah, you know, we're wondering, okay, do we ever really mm. quite, at least in season one, figure out mm. who is he? Mm. Now, it made me think about the biblical text. You know, we have four canonical gospels, and we have other gospels, different perspectives, but in Jesus' day, the jury was out on who is he. Mm. You know, is he a liar, as C.S. Lewis says, a lunatic? Mm. Is he the Messiah? Is he, you know, a revolutionary? Is he fake? Is he, you know, what is he? And so that, that matter of perspective and just how to get at truth, how to get at justice, it, it really is provocative in, in many respects. And can we ever get it? Is it our, only our truth and our perspective? Or is there really a, a truth to be found? And it, it really pushes the, the viewer, mm -hmm. just like uh, that original movie with, uh, by Kurosawa Akita. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, what we started out with, with culture and theology and thinking through how to get beyond cogs in a machine. Just fascinating to me Absolutely. about how perspective in communal context, whether it's with black theology or traditional Western theology, accounting for context, accounting for perspective, seeing our limitations in pursuit of truth and meaning and significance. And that leads us also back to a previous conversation we had regarding a warfare, militarism, and, and patriotism, and in the context of we're always asking, is God on our side or their side? Perspective, truth. Does truth belong to us or to them, whoever them may be, um, or they may be? And, and the idea of who's in possession of truth, back to uh, what we've mentioned about Joshua and the captain of the Lord's army, perspective should lead us to see that truth is on God's side, not necessarily our side. And the question we should ask is, are we on God's side? Because if we're on God's side, then we're on the side of truth. And truth isn't just this abstract, amorphous cog. Truth is the person of Christ. Yeah. And, and the perspective yes. is, if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, that's a perspective. Yeah, and, and our heart's affections come into play. Just the, today I was talking about the rich young ruler in Jesus in Matthew 19, and there are parallel texts in the canonical Gospels where, you know, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Or, you know, he's, he's pushing, Jesus pushes, and he invites him to consider who it is he's talking. Is it just to honorific and give God all the glory? Is or Jesus saying to him, think about it, who are you talking to here? And, you know, Jesus goes on, you know, go sell your possessions. If you want to find the one good thing, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have eternal life and come follow me because this man is a man who's fulfilled the law. Absolutely. He's done everything. And Jesus loves him for it according to Mark's gospel. But one thing you still lack, go sell your possessions, rich young ruler. Give the proceeds of the poor, you'll have eternal life and mm -hmm. come follow me. And the man went away dejected mm -hmm. because he had many riches and he loved his riches more than God. And so often there are things in my own heart that keep me from God. And it's like, you know, am I truly someone who pursues truth? Or am I pursuing my own confirmation bias and my own deity mm. that I want to pursue, like my kingdom, and clutch mm. on to whatever it is mm. that pumps me up and puts me in a place of control? Our hearts often stand in the way of really finding Jesus as the truth, because there are other truth claims presenting us or someone else that stand in the way or something else than Him, mm. and we need to search our hearts 
and say, Holy Spirit, cleanse us. Um, open our eyes that we might truly see, come what may, mm. that we might really live into the truth and that the truth will set us free. Absolutely. And that's fantastic. I think this is a great place for us for us to end this conversation until next time. I'm, I'm so encouraged by, by knowing that that Christ doesn't view me as, as a cog in his cosmos, in his cosmic machine, but rather Christ, Christ comes to me as, as a person. And that God isn't, isn't seeing me as, as expendable, uh, that God doesn't view me as, as a broken person that he can bandage up with glue, but he, he comes and draws me near to him, that he's closer to me even than my next breath. So as we look forward to, to our next conversations, I'm, I'm very excited to, to ex explore the themes of how God is present with us in our culture and in our lives. So thank you, Paul. Well, thank you, Tony. I always appreciate our opportunities to connect like this and in other ways. So thanks so much, Tony Wynn, Paul Lewis Metzger. Thank you for joining us for New Wine Taste.